This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. In Cambridge, uh, and subsequently a bishop. Um, he died in 1901, he was Bishop of London then, um, and uh, a subscription uh, led to the endowment of a lecture in his memory, and it's always been associated with the University of London, and I'm delighted that it's come to the IHR, um, and we uh, organise it each year. And the list of Crichton lecturers is, is really a, a roll call of the most uh, famous historians, really, of, of the 20th century. Our own founder, A.F. Pollard, gave the lecture uh, in 1916, um, and then one could name Trevelyan, um, Frank Stenton, R.H. Tawney, Lewis Namier, Lucy Sutherland, Stephen Runciman, Herbert Butterfield, uh, R.W. Southern, Joseph Needham, Isaiah Berlin, A.J.P. Taylor, about whom we were talking over a cup of tea, Keith Thomas, John Elliott, Eric Hobsbawm, John Pocock, um, and so on, up to and including, and I should mention her because, of course, her passing um, has been so sad, Lisa Jardine, who gave the uh, lecture here, the Crichton Lecture, in 2013. Um, this is not in any way to make our lecturer this evening uh, in any way uh, um, um, timid uh, to be placed uh, late, that's right, <laughs> with all those, those great names. Um, but it is a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, someone I've known for some years in Oxford, uh, Professor Margaret Macmillan, uh, who is the warden of St Anthony's College. Um, uh, she was uh, born and educated in Canada and indeed in Oxford, um, uh, built her academic career in Canada, uh, and Oxford has pulled her back subsequently. Um, and uh, uh, we're delighted uh, that she's on this side of the Atlantic. She's the author of Women of the Raj in 1988, uh, but famously Peacemakers, a book on the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. Um, more recently, she's published Nixon in China, the week that changed the world, and a very useful book for all historians entitled The Uses and Abuses of History. Um, but tonight she's going to talk to a theme which she explored very recently in her book The War That Ended Peace, The Road to 1914. So it's a great pleasure indeed to introduce Margaret Macmillan to you, whose subject is the outbreak of the First World War why the debate goes on. Well, thank you very much indeed, Professor Goldman, for that very kind introduction. And reading out the list of names did, in fact, <laughs> completely. Um, it is wonderful, um, the great honor to be in such a distinguished company, and a great pleasure to be here at the Institute for Historical Research. I've been here before, but I haven't been since your great transformation, and I must say I hardly recognized it. Um, it does look absolutely wonderful. Um, 101 years ago today, the war was going on. It had been going on for over a year. It was a war, of course, as we all know, that people, most people thought it would be a short war, and instead they found themselves in a war that looked like it was going to go on into 1915, and then into 2015, into 1916, and possibly longer. On the Western Front, deadlock had developed. On the Eastern Front, there was still movement, because, partly because the distances were so much greater, but there was no clear victory there either. And people were beginning to use a new term, which I think was coined in France, the term was total war, because this was a different sort of war than most Europeans had ever seen or had been used to. It was a war which drew in the manpower of the European countries, and also, of course, drew in the manpower of their empires. My own country, Canada, contributed um, well over 200,000 men to the Western Front. It was a war that also drew in society's resources, drew in its science, drew in its factories, drew in the talents and, and abilities of its artists to make propaganda for the war. So this was a war which touched virtually every aspect of society and virtually everyone in society. 
the 1914-18 war is a war which still, I think, haunts us because its consequences were so huge. I think we can exaggerate just how different the period before 1914 was with the period that came after, but I think it is fair to say that after 1918, things really were different. That there was a watershed in European and indeed in world history, and that watershed was the 1914-18 war. Its consequences were so enormous. We all know the figures about the loss of lives. We'll never, I think, know how many men died in the war. Nine million, I think, is, is a conservative estimate. And a great many more men, of course, were injured. Never, some of them never really recover again. Women died too, civilians died too. Although the First World War, unlike the Second World War, was not a war in which civilians died on a massive scale. But there were parts of Europe where civilians died. And as the war came to an end, more were going to die, partly because of the influenza epidemic, which spread rapidly through the world, and partly because people were hungry, there weren't the medicines, and so diseases were appearing in Europe, in prosperous Europe, which hadn't been seen in a century. And so the consequences for just Europeans were horrific. The consequences for European society were enormous. European political structures and social structures were badly shaken by the war in some cases, never really to recover. I think it's fair to say that Russia would not have had a revolution if it had not been for the First World War. Or perhaps it would not have had the Bolshevik Revolution. It might have had another sort of revolution, but I think it would not have had the Bolshevik Revolution. <coughs> Russia itself had been an empire, and as the revolution took place, parts of its empire detached themselves and tried, with some success, not, all, not always, to become independent countries. Austria-Hungary, the last multinational empire which had kept peace of a sort in the heart of Europe, was shaken to pieces and disappeared. And older countries such as Poland re-emerged, and newer countries such as Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia were going to appear on the world map. Germany had a revolution and became a republic. There were revolutionary outbreaks across Europe, in Italy, in France, in Britain, even in my own country, in Winnipeg, on the prairies. Um, there was fear that the revolution which had started in Russia was going to spread through the world and leave a very different sort of society behind. Europe had spent down its resources, and as a result, Europe's position in the world had changed. Where Europe had been the most powerful part of the world before 1914, it was now beginning its slow and, and increasingly precipitous decline. And part of the tragedy of the First World War is that it left behind the legacy of violence and of cynicism. The fighting was going to go on. As Winston Churchill said in 1918, the wars of the giants have ended and the wars of the pygmies have started. And there was going to be fighting in much of Central Europe, much of the Middle East, parts of Asia, well into the mid-1920s. And I think if you look at European politics, you could argue, as historians increasingly are arguing, that the war habituated people to violence, and that perhaps some of the violence that you see in politics in the period after the First World War is a result of what the First World War itself did. The violent street theater, the brawls between political parties in countries such as Germany and countries such as Italy, perhaps also owe something to the First World War. And perhaps the greatest part of the tragedy, certainly in retrospect, was that the war doesn't seem to have settled things so that there wouldn't be another war. There was hope at the time that the war had been so catastrophic that Europeans would see that they could not do this again. And yet in 1939, they did it again. And so this is why I think we continue to search for explanations and why we want and we long for an overarching explanation or a single explanation. A.J. Taylor once said that sometimes we have to accept that great events don't have great causes. But I think it's very difficult for us to accept that. We can't, I think, and we don't want to accept that the First World War might have been an accident. You've all probably heard the jokes, um, the rather recent joke in the newspaper in Vienna in 1915, which said, Archduke found a live war a mistake. <laughs> and I do think, you know, there is a sense that it can't have been something, just an accident. It can't have been something that just happened, that it must have had very great underlying causes to explain how the world happened. And of course, the responsibility for the war, how it happened, was not just something that I think was necessary for people to try and find, and I think that's why the search has gone on up until the present, but it was also, of course, politically very important 
because the whole question of responsibility for the war had a very direct impact on the peace that was made at the end of the war. If Germany was not responsible for the war, then it was not legitimate to ask Germany to pay reparations. And so a clause was put into the Treaty of Versailles, the infamous Article 231, which assigned responsibility for the war to Germany and its allies. That became known in Germany particularly as the War Guilt Clause. And it doesn't mention guilt, but I think people who wrote the clause understood that there was guilt attached to responsibility. And the clause was put in. It was actually apparently written by a young John Foster Dulles, who was there as part of the American delegation, it was put in to provide the necessary, as they saw it, legal underpinnings to charge reparations against Germany, to extract reparations from Germany, to pay for the war damage. And so the whole question of responsibility for the war became a very lively political one in the 1920s and 1930s, as Germany, um, I think right across the board, rejected the idea that Germany had been responsible for the war. And this became one of the factors that undermined both the Weimar Republic, which had signed the treaty, but also became one of the appeals that the right wing Hitler, of course, prominent among them, could make to the German public that we were we being held responsible for a war for which we were not responsible. And so the question of responsibility had very direct political implications and has continued to be debated ever since. Now, it's been estimated, I don't know who did the count, um, it's been estimated there's something like 30,000 things in English alone on the origins of the First World War. Uh, I have not read them all, I must confess. But I do think it gives you some sense of how the debate goes on. And we're still going round and round. My book that came out in, in 2004, 2004, 2013 was part of that debate, but the debate was not settled. I, I sort of argued, um, I suppose that it was a combination of factors. Others argued that there were particular countries or particular factors to blame, but there is no historical consensus and I don't think there will be. Every single explanation can be challenged, and every single sort of explanation has been challenged. And I won't run through them all, but let me just run through a few of them, because you can see that they sound compelling, but then you can always find counter-arguments. One sort of explanation was the one that was the, picked up by the Marxists, but also picked up by others, it was all about economics, that what you had was competition for markets between enormously powerful capitalist countries, that as they divided up the world in their empires and their informal empires, the competition became more and more ferocious and the search for profits became more and more desperate. And in the end, they were obliged to fight with each other. That really what it was about was these economic drivers of history. But when you start to examine that argument, it's not at all clear that it really was not economic <coughs> competition. There seem to be other factors in there. And in fact, some of the countries that were each other's greatest trading partners were the ones that were going to go to war. Britain and Germany were each other's greatest trading partners. Germany was the greatest trading partner of Russia, yet those countries went to war with each other. So it seems to me that the economic argument is one that doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. Economic rivalry was certainly there. There were certainly those in Britain, for example, who were afraid of German business mm -hmm. cutting into their markets. There was, there was a wonderful alarmist pamphlet that was published in London in 1897 called Made in Germany which says to the reader of the pamphlet, who is clear, it's clearly directed to the man, says to him, look around your household, and you will see very alarming signs. You will see that your daughter is playing with a German-made doll, and your son is playing with little German-led soldiers, and your wife has gone out in the evening to a concert. What has she been doing at the concert? She has been listening to German music. <laughs> and so you do get alarmist voices on both sides, but in fact, you get far, you also get people in both Germany and Britain who say it's natural for us to be on the same side. We trade with each other, we have a community of interest. And so my own sense is that the economic argument is not sufficient to explain why countries which economically were dependent on each other found themselves at war. A second sort of explanation, and again, I think it can be challenged, is the whole notion of a balance of power and the alliance system um, which helped to be, to, to, to became part of the balance of power. Uh, the argument is that they were inherently unstable, that as Europe divided itself more and more up into camps, the danger was that any conflict between two members of, of, of separate camps would lead to a sort of chain reaction which would draw in all the other members of the camp. I'm not sure, again, that if you look at this explanation that it really holds up. Now, Gray, Sir Edward Gray, the British Foreign Secretary at the time of the First World War, in fact thought the alliance system 
was a force for peace. He said, everybody knows where they stand, and we know who our friends are. In fact, it's a deterrent to anyone on the other side to try and, to try and start something. And I think if you look at the nature of the alliances themselves, they were essentially defensive. They were not as tight as I think was later assumed after the war. And Woodrow Wilson and others made a great play with the fact that the alliance system had obliged European countries to come to each other's defense. In fact, there were only two defensive alliances within, each of, within the two alliance systems, one between Germany and Austria-Hungary, um, Italy as a third party, where they <coughs> pledged to come to each other's defense if attacked by a third party. The other one was the one between France and Russia, which again was, was a defensive alliance. Britain was in the grouping with France and, and Russia, but it had, as Sir Edward Grey famously said um, in 1914, there was nothing on paper. There was an understanding, but Britain had no alliance commitment to fight with France. It had a moral one, and that is what in the end, I think, helped to bring the British into the war, but there was actually no alliance commitment. And Britain had no alliance commitment to Russia. Furthermore, I've always thought that alliances are not, we tend to assume that they're like contracts in civil societies, but who enforces them? If you decide you don't want to fill the terms of your alliance, what actually happens to you? Who's going to enforce it? And Italy decided in 1914 that it didn't want to join in, and the Italians found a reason not to join in. It's, it's usually, and I cite my son's son on this, but it's usually fairly easy to get out of an alliance obligation if you want to. What the Italians said rightly is, is that we only said our, our obligation is only if you are attacked by a third party, but Russia's moving over the frontiers into Germany, and Austria-Hungary is moving down over the frontiers towards Serbia, mm -hmm. moving over the frontiers towards, towards Russia, and so we have no obligation to come in. What's more, the alliance system was looser in another very significant way, and that was that the partners in those alliance systems felt that they had kept freedom of action, that they could actually leave if they chose to do so, and possibly form other sorts of alliances. Um, Germany and Britain kept on talking right up until 1914 about a possible settling of differences among them. And in fact, many people in both countries thought relations were better in 1914 than they had been for some time. They had settled most of the outstanding colonial issues, which had caused so much trouble in the past. And essentially, the British had won the, the Anglo-German naval race. And the German challenge to British naval supremacy had had very drastic consequences as far as Germany was concerned. It had pushed Britain into doing what it never liked to do in peacetime, and that was making a peacetime understanding with both France and then with Russia. Um, two very unlikely friends for Britain to actually be making. A much more natural friendship was with Germany, and, and people on both sides thought this, and there were still those in 1914 who were trying to actually bring that about. If you looked at the congruence of interests, apart from economic interdependence between Britain and, and Germany, they were, they, were, they were quite considerable. Germany had the largest land mm -hmm. army in Europe, Britain had the largest navy in the world. A very neat um, diverse sharing of, of, of military power. They were united, of course, um, by their royal families, although family relations don't always bring greater friendship. <coughs> but there were also, there were, there, were, there, were, there were relations between uh, people much further down the social scale. At, at the time when, when the British cabinet was discussing whether or not to go to war in 1914, four cabinet members had been to university in Germany, and a number of Germans had been to university in Britain, including, <coughs> interestingly, um, not to university, but to, but to Cheltenham Ladies College, and the daughters of Admiral Turpitz, who had started the naval race with Britain, and they had been educated at Cheltenham Ladies College. And so the links were, were really quite considerable, and there were those in both countries who thought that it would make much more sense <laughs> for Germany and Britain to come together, and they could be a stabilizing force in Europe, and a very important stabilizing force. Also in 1914, the British were very worried about the friendship, a very new friendship, only since 1907, with Russia. Um, it had never been an easy friendship. The British continued to worry about Russian expansion southwards and eastwards, and how that might affect their position in India. And there were very serious tensions now developing in Persia, as Iran used to be called. The Russians were continuing to move down the north. The British, of course, had strong interests in the south, uh, particularly mm -hmm. where it affected the sea route, where it affected the, the Gulf. And so you did get, I think, a possibility in 1914, a very real possibility that the entente between Britain and Russia might be broken up. And those in the Foreign Office were very worried that it would not last another year, and the possibility that Britain and Germany might be close together. <coughs> 
what you got in France as well was a concern that the military alliance and the close friendship with Russia might not last. Um, something that really worried the French and, and may have affected their behavior in 1914, that Russia was getting so strong that it would no longer need France. I mean, we tend to think of Russia as a very backward country in 1914, but it had in fact been developing very quickly indeed. Its rate of growth, economic growth, was probably as high as any of the Asian tigers after the Second World War. <coughs> it was rapidly becoming not just a major exporting, agricultural exporting country, but rapidly becoming a major industrial power and a major military power. And it was building railways fast, it was training more and more of its potential soldiers. And the French were concerned that Russia soon would no longer need them, and that would leave them friendless in Europe. So the French were keen <coughs> to look for other possible allies. <coughs> and again, um, Austria-Hungary were concerned that Germany would no longer back them. So it's possible to imagine a 1915 in which the alliance system in Europe would have looked quite different. And I'd just like to go back to my original point that these systems, and this is what they were, were not tight alliances. They were not as tight as NATO, where an attack on one is an attack on everyone. Um, these were much looser groupings. And so my own feeling is that you can't, you can't blame the alliance system for leading to the First World War. It may have helped to contribute to it, but you can also see it as a factor in actually um, perhaps stabilizing things. There are also the, the ideas, arguments, that nationalism, for example, was one of the forces that drove Europe towards the First World War. And I think it's fair to say that this is also a factor that was a sort of heightened nationalism in the period before 1914, which led to public outbreaks, and fears of, of others, and you can see all this in, in the press at the time. But at the same time, mass tourism is growing. So at the same time as you have people in England very worried that the Germans might be planning something awful, I guess then you have massive <coughs> Tourists, tour, massive amounts of tourists going to Germany. And so I think, again, very difficult. And I'll come back to nationalism, but I think it does help poison the atmosphere. But I think it cannot be seen as the only factor which helped to cause the First World War. Another factor that is also often picked on is imperialism. And it is true, again, that you can find examples where imperialism or imperial rivalry brought, brought Europe close to the edge of conflict. The Shoda crisis in 1898 brought Britain and France fairly close to conflict. In both countries, there was talk of the outbreak, um, possible outbreak of a war. Apparently, churches along the coast of France were told to prepare themselves for as centers for people who would be fleeing inland from the British invasion, which was about to land. Um, in Britain, there was considerable fear of the French landing. Um, in fact, it, there, were, there were novels about this. Um, my favorite one is, is the French landing, this was shortly before 1898, but at a time when the tensions were already high, uh, the French landing on weekend, which was seen as particularly unsporting because everyone in the government was away, and only the French would do something uh, so treacherous. <laughs> the, they would land on the south coast. Um, the telegraph lines to London in, in this particular alarmist novel uh, would be cut by Irish nationalists, and the French would seize London and seize Whitehall before anyone realized what had happened. Um, as the English cabinet was happily off shooting grouse or whatever it did on, on weekends. Um, so there were concerns that there might be a war brewing between Britain and France. Um, what Fashoda did, conflict over an obscure village on the Upper Nile, what Fashoda did is, is, is make them both realize that it would be very foolish to go to war. And it helped in a funny way, rather like the Cuban Missile Crisis, it scared both sides so much that they realized that they had better talk to each other. There were imperial rivalries between the British and the Russians, of course, and famously imperial rivalries between the Germans and the French over Morocco. But all those crises were contained, and I would argue that by 1914, imperial rivalry was no longer as dangerous a factor as it had been in, in European international affairs as it had been earlier. The one area which still had the potential, I think, to pose real trouble was the Ottoman Empire. But as long as the Ottoman Empire remained an independent, state, imperialism which was held at bay, and the one major source, of, and there were many sources of rivalry within the Ottoman Empire, but the one which I think came close to threatening war, the one between Britain and Germany, particularly the German plans to build the railway from Berlin to Baghdad, had more or less been settled by 1914. Both sides had come to an agreement, and again, the temperature there had been very much lowered. Well. There are also, of course, the arguments over um, armaments, military competition, and military planning. After the First World War, there was a lot of talk about how the high level of the arms race, and there was a considerable arms race between 
particular after about 1910, that the rearming or the arming of European countries, the arms race, was a destabilizing factor, and that the very existence of large amounts of, of weapons made war more likely. And my argument is, is that they don't necessarily make war more likely. They can actually have a deterrent effect. And if we look at the Cold War, huge amounts were spent in both the Soviet Union and the United States on armaments, which in fact helped to keep a sort of stability. I mean, perhaps not always an easy one, but <coughs> weapons in themselves, I think, don't lead to a war. What I think does cause trouble and, and is worrying is that weapons are always becoming obsolete. And the temptation always is for a country to move while the advantage is with it before the other side has gained an edge. And this was certainly an argument that the German high command were using in 1914, that if we don't fight Russia now, we won't be able to fight it in 1917, because they are going to have the military advantage by then. And so I think an arms race can be destabilizing. Perhaps fear of losing an arms race can be destabilizing. But my own sense is that it's not, again, the single cause we've all been looking for in the outbreak of the First World War. A further variant of that is that it was the arms dealers themselves who wanted war, that they fueled the tensions between countries so they could sell weapons to both sides. <coughs> and my own view on that is that if you are making weapons and selling them, you would prefer to be able to sell to both sides, which you can't do once the war breaks out. But what you really want, if you want to sell your weapons and sell your, your military technologies of various sorts, is you want a state of tension, but you don't want an actual war. And so you had, before the First World War, a crook, for example, helping to build the defenses of the Belgian forts at the same time as he was also building the big guns that were going to knock them down. But from the point of view of crook, this was, this, was, this was what business was about. You sold to as many people as you possibly could. And so war was not necessarily going to, to, to improve your business. Others, and A.G.P. Taylor famously did this, have blamed the tight timetables, the railway timetables, the, 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 all the European armies depended on railways to get them into the field. And these are, of course, the massive armies, and so it took a huge amount of planning and, and very, very detailed railway timetables. And it is true that the needs of mobilization, the needs of moving the troops, imposed a certain perspective, imposed a certain pressure on the military who then in turn imposed it on their civilian masters that if we don't get our plans rolling, we're going to lose faith. And the military used an argument which every, you know, they, they would say very dramatically, every hour's delay means another kilometer given away to the enemy, or every day's delay means that the enemy will be so many further kilometers inside our territory. The civilians, unfortunately, I think, didn't have the knowledge to challenge this, but I do think Certainly the military plans added pressure in the, in the final moments, but I don't think, again, they created the war. And plans can be changed. I mean, that's what you have railway planning units for. And the Germans had one of the best railway planning units in their military in Europe. The head of it was someone who was a General Gerder who was devoted to timetables and railways. In fact, on his honeymoon, um, he used to entertain his wife by saying, shall we make up some railway timetables? <laughs> 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 favorite sort of um, favorite sort of activity on weekends. But when you actually later on, Groda said, now you may have been wrong, but after the war was over, he said, you know, we we were blamed for having said that we have to move in this direction. We can't shift troops. We have to attack on two fronts. And there was this whole question of whether Germany could localize the war and fight only Russia and not invade France and Belgium. And he said we could have done it. I mean, that's what we were capable of doing. We could have redone the plans. And if you look at the war itself, they did move huge numbers of troops at very short notice from one end of the front to the other. And so I think it was possible to alter the plans. Uh, the question is whether people wanted to. So there are all these sort of possible explanations. My own view is that not a single one of them really <coughs> explains why the war happened. So what I tend to come down to is that it's a combination of factors which is not very satisfactory, but it's things happening at a particular time and possibly in a particular order, and then you mix in accident. I still think it's possible to argue that if the Archduke had not foolishly chosen to go to Sarajevo on the 28th of June, if there had been better security in Sarajevo, it was, it was abysmal, if, even then, after the first attack, I mean, you probably all know the story about how this car was going along the Apple K, in Sarajevo, a bomb was thrown at it, it missed the first 
car and hit the second car. One of his aides was very badly injured. And he went on carrying the program. Well, then what they should have done, of course, is gone straight to the railway station and, and got out of town. On the way back, and some of you have probably seen the spot, he, the Archduke wanted to go to the hospital to see the people who'd been injured. The driver took the wrong turn and pulled down a very short street. And by sheer accident, the only one of the conspirators who had not either run away or been captured or had tried to kill himself, there was one left, and that was going to do a princess, and he was standing there with a revolver. And it was an open touring car, and it came to a stop right in front of him. Now, without that accident, we, I think you could argue the First World War might not have happened, or it wouldn't have happened in 1914. And if it hadn't happened in 1914, as I say, things might have been different in 1915. So I think it's a combination of factors. It's the order in which things happen. And I do think you have to throw in somewhere into the mix accident, that without certain accidents, that combination of factors that sequencing might not have mattered. Europe might have got through a crisis, which is certainly how people saw at the time. When the news of the Archduke's assassination came, most people said, that's too bad, but life will go on. And remember, of course, that they had been through a number of crises, and they had got through each of them. There was, I think, an assumption that this is just another crisis. And there's a wonderful bit in the diary of Victor Klemperer, who kept those extraordinary diaries during the Second World War in, in Dresden, but he, one of his earlier diaries, he said, my wife and I were sitting in a cafe in, on the 28th of June, 1914, and a waiter came up and said, have you heard the dreadful news? Um, they said, no, what dreadful news? And they said, well, the Archduke has been assassinated in Sarajevo. And they said, look, each other, well, that's too bad. But look, we're really rather hungry. Can we order now, please? You know, and that, I think, was a very common reaction. And this was not unusual to have, unfortunately, in those days, not unusual that heads of state or common people to be assassinated had been plenty. And so I think there was a sense in Europe that this was not necessarily going to be the final, the final crisis. So what I'd like to do now is just look a bit at <coughs> some of the factors that helped to shape European thinking. My own view is that Europe was at this continent in balance, that there were very strong destabilizing factors. And yes, there were national rivalries, there were economic rivalries, there were military plans being made which could have led to war. There was an arms race. But there were also factors on the other side. There was a very strong middle class peace movement. There was a very strong working class peace movement. There was a general assumption in Europe that war is something we don't do any longer, that we need to move beyond war. And so what I think we have to remember, and it's, we have to put ourselves back into those, those times, that it was not a Europe which was moving in one direction. It was a Europe which could have gone in one or other direction, just like Europe today indeed just like the world today, that, that I don't think these things are foreordained that Europe is going to go down one path and not another path. And so I think we need to understand that just as there were pressures building up, which you could see might lead to war, and perhaps in the end did, there were also pressures building up which could have led to peace. And I'd just like to say something about those before I look at some of the pressures building for war. So many Europeans before 1914 really did assume that Europe was somehow different sort of society. And they could look back to 1815, the end of the Napoleonic Wars, and they could see a century that for Europe was pretty peaceful. Now that doesn't mean there weren't wars. There were the wars of Italian unification, the Crimean War, the wars of German unification, but by and large, with the exception of the Crimean War, those were short wars. They tended to be between just two countries, <coughs> and they settled something. And so when Prussia and its North German allies defeated Austria-Hungary, that actually suffered something. It removed Austria-Hungary from involvement in the German Confederation. When the North German Confederation and its South German allies defeated France in 1870, that led to the birth of Germany. And so Europeans saw war as something that was, if it came, was likely to be short, likely not to involve all the nations in Europe, and likely to be decisive. I don't think they welcomed that prospect, but they didn't see it as something that would engulf uh, the whole of Europe. But more than that, I think Europeans looked back at the century since 1815 and saw a century of extraordinary progress. Now, some, in some people's lifetimes, Europe had gone from being a predominantly rural society to one with increasingly large cities, increasing literacy. The cities themselves had changed. I mean, many Europeans in their own lifetimes had seen the things things such as the introduction of gas lighting, electric lighting, public transportation, <coughs> clean water, a terrific improvement in, in public health. Europeans were living longer. They were eating better. 
They, were, they had access to more consumer goods. And people were very conscious of this change in Europe, very conscious of the ways in which they were living better. It doesn't mean that everyone in Europe was living better because there were pockets of poverty, there were pockets of undevelopment, and in many cases very extensive. But there was a general sense that Europe had moved hugely down the path, which was leading to more and more prosperity, and most people thought that it would go on. They would simply see an increase in well-being and an increase in prosperity. There was also a sense that many Europeans had that they were becoming more civilized, that war was simply something they no longer did. And there was, of course, there were all these strange racial and social theories floating around social Darwinism among them, which argued that some races were more progressive, <coughs> and used race and nation often interchangeably, but some races and nations were more progressive and moved further down the road of civilization. And so war was something those others did. War was something that people in Africa did because they weren't yet part of the great civilized world. War was something that the Americans might do. They might have a civil war. But again, that was not something that the Europeans would do. And so I do think that this was a very important assumption. Apparently, financial advisors used to say to people, people would say, you know, is this a secure investment? And the financial advisor said, absolutely, well, if war comes, but that meant it was absolutely safe because everybody knew war wasn't going to come to Europe. I mean, I think there was, I mean, we can, we can overestimate this, but I think there was a feeling that Europe had moved beyond the war. Stefan Zweig, when you probably read it, um, in his last book he wrote in 1941, shortly before he committed suicide, described his world of his childhood. And he talked about a golden age of security. He grew up before the First World War in a bourgeois Jewish family in Vienna. And he said, my parents assumed that they could save their money, they could pass it on to me, that everything would go on the same, and that the Austro-Hungarian Empire would go on for yet another thousand years. It was simply an assumption that the world was a stable place, and if anything, things were going to get rather better. And there were arguments, too, made that Europe wouldn't do war because it was no longer rational. People looked at the ways in which European economies were interlocked, increasingly intertwined, and of course that was true not just of Europe, but the world more at large. And the period before 1914, of course, was the great age of globalization before our own age. And there were those like Norman Angel who argued that European leaders, European elites, would recognize that there was no point in having a war, that they were much better to trade with each other, invest in each other, that a war, in fact, would just hurt them all. Why, he said in his um, famous great illusion, which was widely popular before the First World War. Why he said, for example, that Germany wanted to invade Belgium. There's absolutely no point, because Germany wants the <coughs> products of Belgian factories. Well, the Belgians are not going to work enthusiastically under an occupation. It's much better to encourage them to develop their factories, encourage them to explore, and Germany will benefit. Germany will see, and Germany's leaders will see, there's absolutely no point in invading Belgium, because they're not going to get anything out of it. And what you also saw in the period before 1914, and Europeans saw it, was the survival of the older tradition of consultation in the Council of Europe, but also newer types of international organization. And this was a great period for talking about international organizations and how the world might be made the sort of place where war simply wasn't necessary for settling disputes or could be outlawed. And so there was tremendous uh, popular support, and, and indeed among elites as well, for arbitration as a way of settling disputes among nations, where two nations would agree if they had a dispute to take it to a third party and agree to be bound by the decision. There was something like 300 arbitrations between 1794 and 1914, and more, those, more than half of those were after 1890. That does say something, I think. People looked at it and they thought, you know, we are moving in this direction, we're developing. This is when they began to talk for the first time about international law. We're developing an international law, just as we have law in civil society, we're now developing a law that will regulate international society. There was also considerable interest and, and good, a good deal of popular support for, if not disarmament, at least arms limitations. Um, there were two big Hague conferences called in 1899 and 1907, where all the great powers attended, where there was discussion of how to, if not get rid of war, at least limit some of its worst effects. And agreements were made on limiting weapons, types of weapons that could be used, certain weapons were outlawed. Agreements were also made on how people living in occupied territory should be treated. Indeed, there was a good deal of discussion about how you define a proper occupation. And this was all seen as a step forward, that it was becoming a more rules-bound 
animal law, law band the international organization. And of course, the permanent um, court of arbitration was set up before the First World War um, to carry out arbitrations. There was meant to be a third um, conference in 1915, but for obvious reasons, that one didn't take place. And I think you also saw the growth of an international public opinion um, dedicated towards promoting the cause of peace. Um, the Nobel Peace Prize was created in this period by Alfred Nobel, who had a certain guilt, I think it's fair to say, that he made a great deal of money out of manufacturing explosives. And so he dedicated a very considerable part of his fortune to a prize for peace. There were international organizations of jurists, international organizations of church people, international organizations of MPs, again, trying to bring different peoples together and talk about ways about blowing war. There were peace crusades. And this was, a lot of this was supported in the popular press. <coughs> then, of course, there was the Second International, the massive socialist and working class movement, which brought together socialist parties from around the world. And at, at its international conferences, every two to three years, the Second International representatives would talk about how they could prevent a major European war. And they believed, or many of them believed, that they had within their means within their hands the capacity to do this. If all the workers in Europe, and people argued this at the time, if all the workers in Europe went on strike when a war threatened to break out, it would be impossible for those giant armies to fill up because they were conscript armies, and so they would have to call in those who were in the reserves. Factories wouldn't work. The railways wouldn't work, so the soldiers couldn't be moved up to the front. The munitions wouldn't be supplied, the coal wouldn't be done, the ships wouldn't be unloaded. And so war would become impossible or highly difficult to wage. The French military planners were so concerned about the prospect of a general strike in the event of war that they estimated that something like 20% of all their reserves would not come when called. And I think it was a very similar fear in other countries. And it has to be remembered that socialists were getting more numerous rather than less. And their parties were growing. In the 1912 election in Germany, for the right side, the socialists became the biggest single party. And it was something that used to give the high command nightmares. Um, could they be relied upon? Um, most of the high command tended to think not. Um, in fact, when the war came, the, 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 the socialists in, in Germany supported it. They voted for war credits. Um, in France, the men turned up. I think less than 0.5% failed to show up. And there were probably people who died or moved away or simply couldn't be traced. But that's not, that was not how it appeared at the time. It appeared that the Second International had the real potential stop a war because of this capacity to prevent the actual making of war. And so if you look at Europe before 1914, you could argue that there are very strong forces, and I would argue very strong forces towards peace, not just a sort of a smug assumption or, or a complacent assumption that Europe has moved beyond war, but those who are working very actively and thinking very actively about how to prevent a major conflict. On the other side, and this is what I mean when I say Europe was, was a nation, a continent in play, on the other side, there, there were the tensions. And so Europe had this tremendous peace and prosperity, but it also had come at a price. Rapid change is never easy. And there were those who were left behind by it, those who felt that they were marginalized. I think we're seeing something very similar today. Small shopkeepers whose livelihoods were undermined <coughs> by the appearance of the mass department stores, artisans, whose work was no, value, no longer valued because so much was now capable of being produced by factories. And they tended, not always, but they, they tended often on the continent to flock to some of the more extreme nationalist parties, um, often anti-Semitic parties as well. Uh, the Jews were somehow blamed, both for capitalism, somehow blamed in, a, in an odd combination for capitalism, socialism, and, and modern, modernity. Um, very uh, very un unreasonable, but um, deeply felt, I think, as a way of trying to explain what was, what was going wrong. I think there was also fear among elites, um, as I've indicated, about their own populations. They knew they needed them. Europe's armies depended on the working classes, the laboring classes in the country, and depended on the large middle classes. But a lot of European elites weren't sure that these people could be depended on, and weren't sure also if they would make very good soldiers. There was considerable fear in Europe about decadence and what's going wrong with the race in Europe. And again, this was the sort of language they used. Worry that <coughs> the disease was making people soft, that what you really wanted were the sort of sturdy peasants from the countryside 
who were toughened by a life outdoors in the field, who were put up with the foundations of military life, who would obey orders properly. Um, I fear that some our cities and the pace of modern life was weakening the race. Um, but the very triumph of modern medicine meant that too many people were living for too long. And I think it's, it's you, you find it everywhere. There's a very popular book by Max Norda called Degeneration, which went through many, many issues. And William Wilhelm Balk, who was one of the leading German authorities on um, military matters, wrote in his the first book, Tactics, uh, the steadily improving standards of living tend to increase the instinct of self-preservation and to diminish the spirit of self-sacrifice. The fast manner of living at the present day undermines the nervous system. The fanaticism and religious and national enthusiasm of bygone age are lacking. And finally, the physical powers of the human species are also partly diminishing. And so there was a fear that somehow people were no longer fit to defend their countries, no longer fit for war. Um, I think by coincidence, uh, this is when eugenics becomes popular. And the first international eugenics conference was held in London, here in London, at the Royal Albert Hall. And its patrons included Alexander Graham Bell, the great inventor of the telephone, Winston Churchill, the first sea lord of the Admiralty, and the president of Harvard University. So this was not just a fringe movement, this, this was, was mainstream. Con that tied into this fear of their own people. And what you also got, I think, was a sense among at least some of the elites was that a good war might actually sort out, um, in a sense, the, the, the unfit from the fit, that it might actually perk up the young men who could be expected to go off and sacrifice themselves, that it might bring out their better characteristics, that it might help to instill in them a sense of self-sacrifice. You also got people, usually men safely beyond military age, talking about how good bloodletting is healthy for society, um, very much like the medieval doctors who believed, or even in the 19th century, who believed in bleeding a patient in some, in some peculiar way to restore um, his, his or her health. <coughs> there was also, and this perhaps is a product of peace, and I think sometimes we see it in our own society, there were those who thought war would be exciting. There were those who thought that war was glamorous, that war might be a way of testing themselves. Young men in Germany, for example, used to complain that we're tired of hearing from our older generation, from our fathers or our uncles or our grandfathers, that they fought in the wars of German unification and we're all hopeless, that we're not prepared to do anything for our country, that we couldn't do it anyway. And so I think you've got a sense among the young that perhaps they'd like to test themselves and a sense that war could be glamorous. I mean, you certainly see it in the early reactions, at least among some people, to the outbreak of the First World War. And so I think there was a sort of worrying tendency in New York to think that war might be a good thing, that it might be good for the, the population. It might also overcome some of the political divisions that were there in European countries that might bring people together in a patriotic union, which in fact, of course, it did in many countries at the beginning of the war. And there was also, I think, a worrying side to European nationalism. Uh, national rivalries were there, but now we've got increased public participation in those national rivalries. Um, some of the very successes of European civilization, like increasing literacy, uh, produce production of mass means of communication, mainly of course newspapers and, and, and cheap books and cheap magazines, also helped to fuel a sort of nationalism, which became, I think, increasingly unreasonable sense that those people over on the other side of the border are somehow different from us and some of our enemies. And this was fed again by these social Darwinist and racialist ideas that you could actually divide the human race up into separate species and that they probably were never going to get on with each other. In fact, there was a lot of talk in this period of hereditary enemies, how the French are always condemned to fight the Germans, the Germans are always condemned to fight the French. That's just the way of it and that's just they didn't use the term DNA then because they didn't know about it, but it was certainly implied that it's in their blood. And I'm afraid intellectuals helped with this. A great many respectable professors in various countries who wrote very learned books, many with measurements of skulls and measurements of noses, trying to prove that you could see a Teutonic race and you could see a French race. A famous German professor who said the Germans have always been more inventive than the French and someone must have said to it at some point, um, but look, the French actually go to France, you see all these extraordinary fortresses, you see all these extraordinary cathedrals, and French civilization produced a lot. And so he devoted his holidays, he would go to France, and he'd cycle or walk around France, and he would look at portraits and statues of French notables, or two effigies of French notables, and he would measure their noses and measure their chins and prove to his own satisfaction that they were the Teutons. <laughs> <laughs> Everything good in France had actually been done by people who 
German in some essential way. And you've got equally silly things going on in France among, again, the learned, um, famous French professor of sociology who said, in a view that was fairly widely accepted, the problem with the Germans, and he said in particular the Prussians, because the French tended to fix on the Prussians as the core of the Germany which they feared, so particular Prussians um, have no moral sense. Why do they have no moral sense? He said, well, they come from a very flat landscape. And so they don't see heights and they don't see depths. And so they're incapable of seeing the difference between good and evil. And we just have to accept that part of them. And there was a lot of this. There was also talk about the age-old struggle between Slav and Teuton, how those people have always been different. Um, it's bad history, it's bad biology, but it was powerful at the time. And you did get the popular press playing this up, and you did get waves of unreasoning panic that would go through the public. I mean, there would be panics. I mean, there were these alarmist novels in Britain about invasions. Um, after the Anglo-French Entente Cordiale, um, the invaders suddenly changed from being French to being German. But there were these waves of, of panic that somehow um, they're about to come. And you've got the same thing in Germany. You've got ridiculous rumors spreading through London that the Germans had pre-positioned weapons in basements all over London, and there was something like 30,000 German officers disguised as waiters working in Britain, ready for the moment when they would clear out of their waiters' uniforms and then begin to take over the British Isles. And I think this did help to destabilize Europe, and governments didn't always like it. Lord Salisbury, the great conservative prime minister, said in the 1890s, he said, it's like having a gigantic lunatic asylum at my back, but I have to deal with it. And I think governments increasingly, even in more autocratic states, found that they had to pay attention to public opinion. And when you get Tsar Nicholas II, the autocrat of all the Russians, saying, I don't dare do this because of my own public opinion, you know that something has changed. And the biggest single newspaper in Moscow before the First World War had a daily circulation of over 800,000. And so although Russia was by no means enjoying representative government, even though it was moving in that direction, it's certainly not a democracy, there was something called public opinion. And I think this, this was important. And so I think you do get pressures, countervailing pressures, to the pressures for peace. You also get, I think, a cult of the military in a number of countries, that the military always right, that the military should not be questioned. And I think it helped to lead to the final tragedy, because I think in certain countries, Russia I would name as one, and Germany is another, the civilians refused to inform themselves of what the military were planning and refused to question them out. And it was a real abdication of power. But I think it was <coughs> because there was this view that the military were in some ways the noblest of the nation. They were prepared to sacrifice themselves, and so you had to accept them. They also, of course, um, were the professions. And so by the time Europe comes to 1914, as I say, there are these pressures on both sides. You can see. You could, if, if there had not been a war in 1914, we could look back and we could now be talking about why didn't Europe have a war and what is the explanation for the peace. Um, as it is, we look back and, and we, we look for the explanations for the war. But I think we should not assume the war was inevitable. We can find all sorts of reasons why the war broke out, but because it broke out, in my view, doesn't mean it was inevitable. Having said that, I think one of the very dangerous things by 1914 was that there had been a series of crises. There had been a series of crises in Europe, some of which had, all of which had been managed, but which had left, I think, a very important consequence. You all probably know the crises, but uh, the Bosnian crisis of, of uh, 1908, when Austria-Hungary and Russia thought they had a deal over Bosnia, um, Austria-Hungary would annex it, and in return, Russia would get its claims in, in the Straits at Constantinople recognized, and Austria-Hungary moved quickly and left Russia looking foolish, and Russia wouldn't get what it wanted. And that was a crisis. There was talk of war. And there were even deterrent measures. People did in these crises begin to, they do things like ordering extra horses very ostentatiously or calling up an extra class of young men to be trained. And so they did use various ways of signaling deterrence to the other side. But the Bosnian crisis went over, was got over. Uh, two crises in Morocco, again, talk of the general war, but again, people backed down. But again, elements of, of showing the other side that you were prepared to fight. Um, in 1911, a war between Italy and Turkey, the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, which I think in retrospect is very dangerous because it showed the weakness of the Ottoman Empire and it broke an unspoken assumption in Europe that you wouldn't attack the Ottoman Empire. The Italians now broke it and others looked at it and thought, well, why not us? Um, and that's exactly what happened in 1912 when the Balkan states 
got together in what turned out to be a very temporary Balkan League and waged war on the Ottoman Empire and it was defeated. The Balkan states then fell out among themselves and then fought each other in 1913 under the spoils. And again, there was talk, as there had been in previous crises, of a possibility of a general European war. And again, there were these signals of deterrence from both sides, of partial mobilizations or the beginnings of mobilization or some military maneuvers. But again, they backed down. There was a conference of ambassadors, people backed down. And so when the crisis came in 1914, I think people, mostly when it started, thought this is just another crisis. We just had two crises in the Balkans. There was a lot of talk, and we had no war. Um, a German a member of the German general staff wrote in his diary after the war had broken out, about a month after the war had broken out, he said, if anyone had told me then, i.e. You know, at the end of June 1914, that the world would be ablaze a month later, I would only have looked at him with pity. For after the various events of the last years, the Morocco crisis, the annexation crisis of Bosnia-Herzegovina, one had slowly but surely lost the belief in war. And I think that was a very widespread attitude. This is just another crisis in the Balkans. Yes, it was a tragedy for the Austrians, but it was not going to lead to anything. But the other side of that, drawing the lessons from the crisis, was something quite different. And what we now know is that in some countries, people were saying, never again that this time we won't back down. And so on the one hand, you had the assumption that all would be settled, but on the other, you had, at least in certain quarters, people saying, no, we backed down before, we were humiliated before, I'm not doing it. After the Bosnian crisis, Tsar Nicholas wrote to his mother, he said, um, Germany has not has, has behaved very badly, and they allowed Austria to get away with it. I will never forgive them. I will never forgive what I'm um, And I'll never forgive Germany, and I will make sure this doesn't happen again. And so I think the other side of the series of crises was a determination in Russia, certainly, not to be humiliated again, and a determination on the part of Austria-Hungary not this time to be humiliated, um, not this time to, to have to back down. And of course, the crucial, in my view, the crucial decisions that are made in 1914, in that month, it's only a month from the assassination to just about five weeks, actually, for example, from the assassination to the outbreak of war, is this determination this time not to back down. And Austria-Hungary determines to finish Serbia this time, it will not back down, even though they know Russia might come in. They tell themselves Russia probably won't come in, but there is talk, certainly in the inner circles of Vienna, about how even if Russia comes in, <coughs> we'll somehow survive. And if we don't survive, so old and glorious an empire cannot go down without a fight. And that, I think, was what was so dangerous about 1914. And then, of course, you had Germany giving its blank check to Austria-Hungary in the first week of July, Partly because it was afraid it would lose Austria having as an ally and saying this time we won't back down, this time we'll show Austria and we'll go with them. And then what you get, of course, is Russia deciding to back Soviet and this time it won't back down. And so I think without the precipitating factor of the assassination, things might have turned out differently. But I do think you have to understand those decisions that were made in 1914 in a much wider context. What they're thinking in 1914 is what's happened in the previous years. That's what's in their minds. And they are also worried about such things as facing their own people. How will they manage to pull the nation together? And are they really fit for war? And so Europe goes from peace to war in five weeks. It's a very short time. The explanation, I think, lies in the combination of everything, which isn't very satisfactory. And so I don't think we can explain it in the sense of finding one person to blame, one country to blame, one thing to blame, one idea to blame. Um, but I think we, all we can do is try and understand how the decision makers got themselves into a position where they thought they had to do it, they felt they had no choice. I think if there's a lesson in it, and I don't like lessons in history, um, it's we should never think it couldn't happen to us. Thank you.